The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We're Team M2, uh, Team Worms. We rectify microwave signals, or at least we're trying to. Um, I'm Zach. I'm Daryl. So first, let's talk about motivation. Uh, there were a couple of different options that could have um, that we could have gone with. Uh, you know, this was pretty much the microwave team, but originally solar power was also an option, or other you know, power transmission methods. So why did we choose microwave? Why are we going to them? Uh, not because of this. Not because microwave signals at about 2.4 gigahertz can spin the hydrogen molecule and keep things up. That's not the motivation for this uh, project. Motivation is uh, microwaves are very efficient for transmitting a large amount of power. You know, the uh, small wavelength has a lot of power in it. And um, historically, this has worked. So basically, when people want to create power transmission systems, they will generally go to microwave when it's um, you know when they have high current applications, and it also passes easily through the atmosphere, which is important when you're talking about um, space applications. So in this case, it's the space elevator, but um, I'll discuss a couple other things. So some uses, uh, aircrafts. So sometimes you might want an aircraft which doesn't have power on board. You want to actually beam the power. Uh, Tesla. Uh, about 100 years ago, you know, worked trying, you know, some like uh, power transmission systems for aircrafts. But also, really, um, the big push nowadays is transportation, especially space applications, and power. So, what about a uh, solar power station that's just in geosynchronous orbit with the, uh, you know, with Earth? That's actually receiving sun, and then it can beam down that power to a uh, bright antenna array, basically. Okay. Um, so those are some of the uses and why we why microwaves were chosen. Um, now to cover what the requirements of this particular project was. Um, we were the rectenna team, so we were focusing on the receiving side of the equation. A rectenna is an antenna connected to a rectifying circuit. That way you take a current that's coming in, alternating, and it becomes a direct current. Um, we had to provide enough power to the climber over 50 seconds to meet the following requirement, requirements. <coughs> Uh, to its capacitors rates. We had, the, basically, the capacitor rate had to supply a certain thing to the climber. And we were designing the thing feeding into the capacitor rate. So the capacitor rate had to supply 24 volts, approximately 400 watts of power, and out of that, you get 16.7 amps being drawn from the capacitor rate over time. Uh, the other requirement we need to work with is we need to shield the rest of the climber from the microwave source. Uh, you have a receiving end. Above that, you have a bunch of electronics, motors, things that determine, and, and computers as well, along with, uh, there's a wireless uh, connection on the climber that we're not, we don't have to use, but it would be nice to use. And to do such, we would have to have shield between the receiving sort, the receiving panel, and the rest of the climber. So, to cover some of the parameters, um, what we chose for our optimizing parameter was the efficiency of the rectangle panel. Um, some of the constraints that we couldn't mess with were the size of the beam, the speed of the climber. Uh, we chose to keep the speed of the climber constant for this right here, which I'm going to cover in a second. Um, the amount of capacitor energy, there are specific rules that say we can only have a certain amount of energy on the climber in the capacitor at any one time. And the efficiency of the climber. We were working with a climber that was built, we weren't allowed to modify the climber to change its efficiency. Um, with this, it was possible to generate a constraint equation, which is right here. Um, what this basically says is that the power that is currently stored in the climber, so power out, this is power out. I, I think that's correct. Um, basically, the difference between the power leaving the climber and the power coming into the climber integrated over time must be between zero and one-fourth of the total potential energy of the climber, because that was the limits of the capacitor array. Um, you can then take the power out and expand it into the density of the field times the ratio of the antenna per the overall rectenna panel 
times the overall area of the panel times the efficiency of their antenna minus the speed of the climber, or the energy of the climber, the energy that the climber goes through per second divided by the efficiency of the climber integrated over time. So, writing an answer. So how do we actually create a fairly efficient antenna array which we can actually pull the microwave? Uh, how do we do that? So basically, since we don't really have all of the RF theory background, we kind of wanted to see what has worked in the past. Let's try to apply some mathematical models, basically base our design on something which has been proven in the past. So we did a little bit of research. Uh, we found one company or one um, group um, that created this Mylax, uh, which is a small airplane which actually receives uh, microwave uh, radiation that you beam up to it and the entire thing is powered just from that. And I'll show a video in just a second of that. And you can see, this is the uh, right antenna right, right here. And these small um, you know, receivers look a lot like what was presented um, a couple days ago. Uh, also, just some other things. There's uh, a rect antenna, which we found, that word we kind of coined ourselves. But it basically is a, a small rectifying circuit, a uh, microwave, um, a little small antenna for about 2.4 gigahertz. So you can actually hold this in front of a microwave and a little LED will power from that. And this is um, the design that we finally ended up going with, which uh, I mean, basically it's uh, Texas A&M University. They uh, you know, published a paper defining this one uh, right antenna. Uh, and we ended up going, you know, basing our design off of that. Uh, microwave, you know, just, you know, Research really started after World War II as far as uh, power transmission. Uh, NASA really in the 70s and 80s started to get involved with it. And uh, now it's pretty much space based, mostly, for research. So you'll see a car which is going to be driving underneath and it's actually beaming the power up to this. Uh, you can't see anything. Oh, no. that's due to um, change the screen resolution. So there's the car right there. It's beaming up. This is its line. So this is able to go up to 150 meters um, and still be powered and move. So this is it's pretty good. It's a pretty good model. Uh, they were receiving 400 watts. At 150 meters, they were receiving 400 watts per square meter with a, uh, I believe it was a 5 kilowatt output on their um, you know, transmission device in the car. And the receiver was just this. Not that big. Yeah. Uh, so you know, basic um, you know, rectifying circuit is it, it takes you know signal which is alternating um, between positive and negative, and using a diode, we're using two diodes, so it's a full wave rectifier as opposed to a half wave. So when the current's going one direction, it captures all of this through one diode. When it's you know negative, it's capturing through another diode. And since you know this amplitude is going down from zero. We use just basically a filtering capacitor just to kind of keep levels approximately stable. This was our initial um, you know, design, kind of sketching it out. What we wanted to go with is we wanted you know, a large like, array underneath this climber device. So we created a basically a three-layer system. So the top layer, and this is a scale model of it, is a structural component. Um, and this is going to be made out of carbon fiber. So very lightweight, but still fairly rigid. And um, you know, we reduced some um, holes just basically for weight considerations. And then these holes, they're scaled, but uh, they're for brackets, which will basically mount to, uh, you'll see a picture of the entire climber um, in just a second, right here and there. So it'll mount to these uh, legs, which come down with the little brackets there. And uh, this is the top. So if you want to go back just one slide. So then underneath that, we're going to have uh, basically a uh, re uh, reflective material. This is actually, we're kind of combining two things in one with this reflective. This will be the carbon fiber. Right underneath that, there will be a um, very thin layer of steel, which will basically reflect microwave radiation. So this team, you know, the first team that presented was saying they need to protect against 5.4 gigahertz, or I mean 5.8 gigahertz uh, radiation. That's not going to be uh, necessary if this works out. As long as you have some type of conductive metal between that and the, the climber and the receiving array, 
it will reflect back to the microphone. So it has to be a certain width, but it's so small, it's probably not even something to consider. You can check it, first, but it's a fraction of what we're talking about. So in the initial design, we really take into consideration very many weight considerations, such as the tolls and the so there's this one. This is the uh, panel, which basically is the reflective panel. And then underneath that, we're going to have these boards, which are basically uh, antenna arrays, large arrays. And that's going to be stuck to the underside using uh, like a foam thermal conducting adhesive. This is a schematic of um, one sample panel. So these panels will kind of go into a uh, configuration almost like spokes on a wheel. And you know, here is a schematic and then a board layout. Uh, you know, diodes, capacitor, and then these are the antennas. Okay. Performance estimate. Okay, now that we had a prototype, it was time to do some analysis. Or we didn't have a prototype, we had a design. It was time to do some analysis of the design and see how it performed. Specifically in relation to those equations I showed you earlier. Um, here's the equations again, just for review. And then we took specific portions of these equations and set them to set values. Uh, at the very end, after we set these values in, uh, the really big one right here is R use divided by R and on use. Because by using this design uh, right here, there was a very specific size to a rectina panel. And there was only these two antennas, which had a very specific size. We could only receive power from the microwave field at the antennas. The rest of this was useless space, and it has to be reflected in the equation, which is right here. You multiply the ratio of usable material divided by the ratio by what could not be used. Actually, that should have been everything. Um, but I believe that was reflected in this. So the answer to that was, was 0.26. 26% of the rectenna panel was usable. What well, was an antenna? The rest was just diodes and circuits was not receiving power. Which would mean that you're basically, right off the bat, throwing away three quarters of your... Exactly. Power, right? yeah. So, because we only had two variables, the efficiency of the climber and efficiency of rectenna, and we had a range, we were capable to generate a, um, a bounding constraint on the efficiencies. Basically, by looking at this graph, you can say the efficiency of our climber is 60%. Therefore, our rectennas must be between approximately 43% efficient and 97% efficient. To change this, the upper constraint would be, could be moved only if you increase the velocity. There's various parameters you can play around with to change these constraints. Um, the lower one's pretty much fixed, except for the fact that the ratio is extremely low. If it was possible to increase that ratio significantly, um, you might sacrifice some efficiency of the rectenna. But if you look at the equation, the rec this thing, the efficiency of the rectenna weighs has just as much weight as the ratio. So there's a little bit of a trade. There's a, there's a very good trade-off there, um, and this actually gets to a lesson we've learned, which I'll come back to in just a little bit. Okay. Um, also, the beat. All right. The beam density estimation is both low and it's idealized. It assumes the one, at least in this graph, we assume that there was perfect collimated radiation and nothing was lost. Okay. Manufacturing. How do we actually make it? So first, PCB fabrication, which would be these are a bunch of single panels. Um, this is how it comes from the shop when you have it professionally prototyped. Uh, but these are a bunch of single panels of rectenna arrays. Uh, they're not connected to each other. But this is basically what it's going to look like. Um, you know, once you have it professional manufactured. And how that works, this is the machinery here. You basically have a uh, substrate in the center, which is this plasticky uh, material. And then you have some type of conducting, generally like a copper layer on top and bottom. And you know, really the most common way of, of creating this is you basically print on uh, your trace. So wherever you want you know, conductivity, you print that on using some type of uh, resistive ink. Um, and that resistive ink, when it's dipped into chemicals, will protect the uh, conductive material in those points, and the rest will basically disintegrate. So what you have here is, you know, this was all fully covered by what's underneath. This has a second layer on top of it now. That's why even this is kind of greenish. Okay. 
but this is where it was protected. And here you see the panel, and then this is the uh, you know, Tuesday's uh, retina array. We were kind of playing around with it. I don't think you could see it. The contrast is very low, but um, we were basically playing around with this the other day um, around a microwave, seeing if there's any leakage, if we could detect anything. And of course, the tuning is not you know correct, and we were kind of hacking it. We like stick and we stuck in probes, and we're just using a multimeter. But when we turn on the microwave, um, you know, an old microwave at East Campus. We were getting about half a volt um, that was showing, and, and it was very low current. So you know, you're not going to be microwaving your <laughs> brain when you try to look at your meal, but um, it's still significant. And the water jet to create you know, the um, more structural materials and the shielding, you all uh, understand how that exactly works. Cost estimate, um, basically we uh, came up with the conclusion that it's going to cost about $1,700. Uh, really, the bulk of that is creating the uh, circuit, so having that prototype professionally. Uh, because making it by hand is just really a hassle, and it's not very exact. It's not very, uh, it's not going to be very good. Uh, just quickly, if you go back. Okay. All right. Uh, just to the cost estimate. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we have, um, you know, large machine rates and stuff. Uh, labor rate we brought down for assembly because we could just hire a drop for $9 an hour have them uh, you know, assemble the device for us. Uh, hey, you guys are starting to talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> yeah, so you can move on. Okay, so future work to be done. Uh, one thing that I think would be very valuable is to create an actual mathematical simulation, I'm now using a pointer, of the equations that were shown earlier, especially since by tweaking each of these, you can determine what the best velocity is for your climber. Um, the big thing is to change the rectenna design. Right now, and this is actually going to skip ahead to lessons learned, variable optimization can be subtle. We chose our optimized variable to be the efficiency of the rectenna. That's not what we should have chosen. And this was actually brought up at one point between me and Zach, and I, it, it got glazed over. Um, actually, Zach brought it up. It should have been the maximum amount of power you could have gotten out of the climber. Because the A&M design is designed for efficiency per okay. panel, yeah. not per the entire array. The entire array itself, there's that trade-off I showed you between the ratio and the efficiency of the retina panel. So the, if we were to look at just one of those things and try and maximize it, we would have had to both look at maximizing efficiency and minimizing size. If you look at the actual size of the patch antenna, it's very small for the surface area, whereas this is very dense. So when you don't try and maximize the efficiency of those rectenna panels, it becomes much less complex and it becomes actually cheaper. Because you're trying to get as much antenna area as possible. You're, you're trying to weigh between antenna area and rectenna efficiency, the re rectifying circuit efficiency. Um, and then the final thing or for future work to be done is to do an actual build and test the equipment, then tweak off, then tweak the trade-off between efficiency and the area of the antenna until it's optimal. Finally, lessons learned. Um, sometimes a fine-tuned fine -tuned answer is not necessarily the best answer. Uh, you over-constrain yourself, you look at the wrong areas. Um, the best way to get results is to perform tests. Zach was talking about how we took that antenna right over there, um, the big one, the one that was brought in on Tuesday, sorry. That one, we hooked up a multimeter, went to a microwave, and we're like, are we getting anything out of it? Yes, there's a noticeable voltage drop across it. Um, and you know, it, it gives you a better idea of what you're working with. And have very well-defined goals when you start out to serve the team. Uh, specifically, those equations I developed up there, if I had known that I was going in that the direction I eventually ended up in, I originally just wrote the equations down and was like, oh, I can find a bounding envelope. It would have been possible to concurrently build the simulation I've talked about for future work. It would have been very easy to build it alongside it. And then it will show you all sorts of graphs, which I can't. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Any questions? Um, with that, of oh, the board you have. Um, uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're only using one side of it, it, it appears. That's correct. Um, I mean, couldn't you markedly increase the area efficiency by putting some of the circuitry on the other side? Um, 
Well, there's actual like RF considerations and all the spacing really matters for efficiency. So perhaps you could maybe space them a little bit better, but there's still like this trace needs to go that length, otherwise you're really going to struggle with this efficiency. It, it's the trade-off yes. thing again. If we could, this was brought in on Tuesday's lecture, and we think it's a great design, uh, especially for, we're going to talk about uh, within MidSet, mid -set, of putting the diodes and the rectifying circuit behind. Yeah, that's what I was And as a result, you get this. The third dimension, and you say a lot of two-dimensional space. Exactly. You can put a bunch more pack antennas on the space. The problem is, of course, there's an efficiency trade. Yeah, I mean, in this case, this is probably the better solution to do that. Because you're just trying to crank as much power as possible. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, I think there's one. So why don't you, I, the only part of the retina that has to be actually uh, exposed to the microwave radiation is our two square patches. So why don't you stack them on top of each other? Um, stack them on top of each other? You have one so where you have this, the yeah. stacking offset, and then the third one behind it, the third one. Oh. You know, again, you're using a third dimension. You could probably do that. That is, that is exactly right. You could probably do that. You just need to make sure that, I mean, that could be done. And that's a good idea. You just, you need to make sure that wherever you have, you know, the pad, that even the, the traces on wires and stuff are not blocking the patch antennas. No, Otherwise, you know, it's going to block the radiation. So be careful. But you should be able to probably double your view that you're going to wear. That's possible, yeah. But um, with the current idea of what we're going to do, that's not necessarily going to be that important, but that is a very good consideration. This is unlikely. We're changing it. Uh, Thomas, you had a question? Oh, that was the same issue. The same issue. I, I had a question about the uh, system, system level tray, the connections between the power beaming system, the rectenna, and then the climber. You guys assume a one meter radius rectenna for your nominal calculations. And that gives you the, you know, the watts per square meter uh, number that you have there. Um, so, what are the considerations? If, if you were, I'm not sure if you're open to that, but if you were open to reconsider the actual size of the rectenna, uh, I guess if you make it small, it means you have to have a higher power density coming in. If you make it bigger, lower power density, but a heavier rectenna. But maybe then the pointing gets easier, or the, the you know the That's true. pointing accuracy. Can you discuss these trade-offs a little bit? Heavily dependent on the actual beam length. So what we wanted to do is we really didn't want to have uh, you know a bunch of surface area, which was most of the time not in the beam length. So we wanted to make sure that there's going to be some swing. That pretty much we always want to have most of that rectangular panel in the beam. Length. Otherwise, it gets just useless yeah. surface area. So that was. That consideration, and then it came down to let's maximize how much power we get given that constraint. But, but where's the beam width going to come from? Who's going to decide on the beam width? We the, were operating on the diameter of that of the parabolic dish. We had chosen a diameter, yeah. and then when talking to them, um, they were talking about focusing it on that diameter. Yeah, so, so that slightly changed things midway through. The diameter is reasonable because if you make it larger than this, the swing is going to push it out anyway. And focusing the light, you will see during our presentation, what we have is power per cubic meter, which is just right. So that's right. You guys are coming up. Maybe I should re answer it after this. Are you going to use your own computer? Thank you very much. Yeah.